running the same strategies, if they decide to run some top lane priority, or if they just look on game by game, where do we attack the other team's potential weaknesses, which for Cloud9 would be, why don't you just go for the new guy and gank Incarnation a bunch? Why not go for the new guy? How big is the solo queue champion's pool? We'll have to see. Incarnation to be getting hit too hard here is one LeBlanc is banned by Cloud9 themselves, so Bjergsen can't get that. But focus on the Alistar and Sejuani here from Tom's Team Solo Mid. Yeah, Alistar is a pick that we'll be seeing more and more in competitive play. It was heavily picked and banned in the European LCS. So much of the early support game is about roaming right now, and Alistar is one of the best in doing so. Pretty swift picks and bans, nothing crazy fast. Both teams know what they do not want to be facing right now. Team Solo Mid, however, definitely taking their time with the voice of Loco Doco here just behind them on stage as they finish this one up. Yeah, it's always interesting to see how the picks and bans change after major international events like MSI. Even though Urgot was this incredibly high priority pick there, he's been <laughs> less so uh, in the new competitive seasons mm -hmm. across China, Korea, and Europe. And now North America gets a chance here. Rumble, actually, the first pick. Same as it ever was for Ball. Same as it ever was. And that Ash ban as well. You think about the changes that just happened to her and the synergy Sneaky and Lemon used to have with Ash and X Lane. So could be very big for them coming this season with those changes. The Rumble, however, gives Cloud9 a bit of objective focus already here. Yeah, and I really wonder what TSM's going to end up doing here with Alistair already being banned off the board. They may just look to try and take Thresh. Those might be the two major supports these guys are trading against each other. I also wonder uh, if we're going to be seeing a Rek'Sai early pick. Not from TSM, maybe Cloud9 picks it up on this rotation. Could be, a lot of Medios to be a little bit more aggressive in that early portion. The jungle, Gragas is still up if Santorin wants it. We've also seen a little bit of Evelyn here and there, kind of making her way yeah. back into the scene as, Plenty as well. Stuff. Yeah, here I actually wonder that the Urgot is a flex pick between the AD carry and mm -hmm. mid lane. Although Wild Turtle hadn't played Urgot in competitive play, so when TSM picked it, it was typically a mid lane pick. But we've had a large off season here where he would have had a chance to add that to his pool. A lot of damage coming out of C9 here with Gragas, those picks. of course. Gragas goes in. The Rexai might just sway to the side of Team Solo mid. Yep. Giving that to Santorin. The Thresh pick up here for Lost Boy. Very good. He can definitely have an early aggressive game, get himself into some sticky situations, as well as get that lantern in for Santorin to get himself into some scary situations if they're roaming together early. Yeah, a lot of versatility Yeah, from that Thresh pick. The Gragas and Rek'Sai, probably the two most potent junglers on this patch, thanks to some of the early game pressure, which will be fairly critical in this game. I mean, even if we just look at Cloud9 vs. TSM playing in the North American Spring Split Finals, right. we saw lane swaps every game. We saw a lot of early game jungle mind games. Absolutely. And having that early strength is pretty important. The fact that TSM has been able to lock down Maokai and Rek'Sai, just all the CC and tank coming through them is is pretty potent, yep. which makes the Kog'Maw pick actually pretty nice. It's actually something we were mentioning at MSI as well with the lane swaps and the fact that they didn't, and even themselves being kind of set back with, we lost with our perfect composition. Yep. And that's not something that can happen if it's the champs you need to get right off the bat. And you have to wonder if the perfect composition for the team, you know, how does TSM respond to that coming back into the North American LCS? Do they right. think that they had the meta read improperly and they then change what yeah. their perfect composition is? Or do they judge it just based off of execution? It's always that interesting back and forth and you never know how a team is going to respond after devastating losses. It's also very clear that that's a Kog'Maw mid for incarnation. Yep, Sivir Nautilus making it all the way down. I, I mean, there's a Thresh on the board already, but it was a Bard Hover, yes, indeed. Uh, yeah, Sneaky and Lemonation getting two of their favorites, actually, in these pickups here, and as well for the team to either get out or get in to some crazy situations. We are looking for the round off here from Team Solo Mid. What will they try to counter with? Give themselves the upper hand in this composition. For the Twisted Fate, yeah. We've seen Bjergsen kind of straight to the wayside of his compositions. We saw the Cho'Gaths coming out at the end of the season there. Haven't really seen too much of that, however. Turtle put in a lot of Urgot practice after MSI, so he could oh. successfully run it as a flex pick, which means now TSM could counter pick that mid lane if they want to. 
And speaking of which, all champions are enabled on this LCS patch. Victor <laughs> had been disabled due to a health bar bug for the largest portion of that last split. But he's healthy now. Now he's back. He's healthy indeed. Last time Bjergsen was playing this champion was I Am Katowice, where he was crushing with it. Uh, we'll see how this goes now. I'm glad I get to get a Victor game with you, chat. This is going to be fun. It's about time I get to cast Victor. He's been one of my favorite <laughs> champions for years. It'll work. We'll see if Team Solo Mid can keep their right head. We heard a lot of the teams saying it was something they couldn't fix, just a, a tilt of communication, and it could not be righted within the games. Well, they're already in the game here, so hopefully the ship, as I said before, is righted. Cloud9 looking to see what Incarnation can do. What's your idea for this? Do you help that guy out or kind of let him flourish and see what he can do here on his first stage appearance? Well, on AP Kog'Maw, specifically for Incarnation, he's going to have to be turtling out a fair bit of the early lane phase. So. If there's a lot of pressure, the only thing that he should be vulnerable to would actually be diving, which generally means I actually think Meteos is going to be more looking to help the other lanes and kind of leave Incarnation on his own. We'll have to see. Charlie getting the notebook from Lemon, making his way over to Loco Doco as the coach shakes hands for our first game here, coming in to the 2015 LCS Summer Split. It's been a little too long since we had LCS. I was itching yesterday watching the EU games. I was like, I want to cast. I want to cast this fight. And now we get the chance, Patience. and everybody gets to watch because it's going to be amazing. Head over to Twitter while the teams load into the game and share what you, who you think will get the first win of the split. Tweet hashtag C9 win or hashtag TSM win as these guys make huge plays to at LOL Esports. We'll see how you're voting in just a few minutes. Everybody in the crowd is ready. A huge 10 countdown as the show started. And you know what? We're about to be on to the rift and get our first game underway. Cloud9 versus Team Solo Mid. We're on the rift. Good to be back. Good. Cloud9 versus TSM. We got some staples. Balls is rumble in the top lane. Incredibly impressive competitive record. But we also get to see Wild Turtles Urgot here, as well as, of course, the debut of Incarnation on AP Kogma in the mid lane here. Okay, credit to Turtle for learning that Urgot. Not a lot of AD carries like to play <laughs> Urgot. They all have to, though. They all start to the have to. And Bang's going to start doing it all the time. you got to be able to hit that on an international stage. Got to get your dance off. Make sure you're limber. Stretch the hammies. You don't want to pull anything. And everybody's getting ready to go in for the fight here. Interesting how both teams were actually posturing for a, a potential five-man invade. Mm -hmm. These teams had been doing defensive line openings uh, for a large part of the split. And now it's actually TSM who bullies their way in for wards. They actually end up winning this one uh, fairly heavily because what ends up happening when a team five-mans at level one mm -hmm. is they will invade for the wards and oftentimes teams will fall back and then slip around the other side of the map to get deep wards of their own but right now tsm is the only team that was able to get two deep wards so now tsm has knowledge of the blue side of cloud9's jungle but cloud9 doesn't know a damn thing watching last night as well i rewatched the finals and something like this happened exactly where meteos headed over got a quick ward on the raptors so dyrus couldn't do anything if they were really going to get the split and he wanted to kind of sapling out the Raptors there. So a little bit of a change up as well for that 5v5 to be pushing C9 off the top side of the jungle. Nice by Team Solo Mid. We're going to start off with the doubles. It's going to be down at Gromp as well as up at the Krugs. Bjergsen with the one little Raptor <laughs> to maybe surprise Incarnation to level two. Not interesting, that, no, actually. He got those because of the, the saplings. So he's oh, he got six now. He got all three. He got the four. Yeah, or the three. Sorry, thank you. I mentioned Fog of War. It's a sapling start from right. Maokai. One spell over from the mid laner gives him that. Heck yeah. Typical TSM sacrificing Dyrus's farm a little <laughs> bit for Bjergsen, but it's a pretty common tactic among Maokai's. Mm -hmm. Interesting how Balls was actually prepping a double jungle with Meteos where he helped with Red, but then he realized the lane swap wasn't going to happen, so he had to teleport up to the top lane right away. This will actually give Dyrus an advantage in that top lane. Push out quickly as well to Bjergsen. They make sure to put a mark on that mid lane immediately and try and make him at least blow a flash. Nothing though, as he's playing it safe for now, but you can see right off the bat, if you can get Incarnation just a little bit, they're going to try to, even if it was just a few CS or a bit of health. But so far, it's working in favor of Bjergsen still because of that knowledge. And now Dyrus moves in. Yeah, a lot of this is just based off the knowledge that was gained by TSM from the level one. They had the deep wards, Cloud9 didn't. Therefore, Cloud9 had to guess where TSM was going to be, and they guessed a little bit wrong. So Balls was late to the top lane, which allowed an invade from Dyrus, which gives even more knowledge now to TSM, meaning they know where the Gragas is. 
and it allows TSM to play the rest of the game with knowledge of the jungle. And really well done by Dyrus. Still up in CS, even leaning the lane, leaving the lane for that situation. So just timing everything perfectly. This is going to give Santorin time to work on whatever he wants. He's already down inside the Raptor camp on the side of Cloud9. Just getting some wards in. He wasn't able to pick up some resources just yet. But he does sneak right around Lemon there. I don't think he saw anything about it. Maybe he did. He's heading back down. Thinking about a counter gank here if it happens. Interesting sneak there by Medios. He's waited long enough from when he was in his jungle yeah. that Dyrus would be playing overly passive to not do much. But the wave's in an interesting spot here. It'll be tricky if they wanted to gank Dyrus. Medios, not his usual self here. Yeah. He usually spends a larger portion of the early game just farming instead of doing a very slow through the top lane gank. That's going to set him back a little bit and maybe open up an opportunity for Santor to pressure. Slowly waiting for one more step up, waiting for that wave to collapse in as well. They can't get the gravity field out in time. Our Incarn incarnation flashes away. Got used to saying that name. <laughs> and his flash will be down. Maybe a rinse and repeat here for Santorin. Yeah, I mean, we can talk about Victor for a little bit here. Early on in the laning phase, he's not devastating, but Kog'Maw's early laning phase is also quite weak. Adding to the fact that Rek'Sai's early ganking needs to be respected, mm -hmm. and the fact that Bjergsen has had knowledge of where Meteos has been the majority of the early game, kind of explains this large CS gap that is opening up, right. just based off the knowledge and the general matchup. Bjergsen playing it very well, and maybe Incarnation could have picked up two or three CS that he didn't time properly with his last hits, but outside of that, there's not much more he could have done. I saw a few of those Qs actually just missing some CS, and they died to the minions as well. Maybe some jitters. Definitely already getting more help from Meteos here, so on the side lanes to do what they can to keep the pressure onto TSM, coming from Cloud9, I should say. They can't afford to fall behind with what's happening here in mid. Yeah, Bjergsen, wow. 47 to 19 after he's able to shove that up. Plus, Bjergsen gets to back with an ideal amount of gold uh, for Victor. Victor generally wants to back with 1,000 gold, or in this case, 1,350 gold. So not only can he upgrade his Hex Core for his E, which will now shove in Kog'Maw yep. even faster, the upgraded Death Ray, he also picks up Boots, which are another very critical thing for Victor. The way his trading works, if you want to get the Q auto attack harassing, you need to be faster than your opponent. Since Incarnation couldn't farm up and get tier boots instead just a tier, Bjergsen now has a move speed advantage on him as well, which just adds to how much pressure Bjergsen can put out as Victor mid here. See where Santorin decides to go. Looks like Bjergsen should have a hold on this, so we may get a little more effort to the side lanes from Santorin. Everything seems safe, though. Charging up the tier as Wild Turtle in the bot lane. It seems like they have come into this one with a straight head on their shoulders, and everything is uh, par right now. Balls in the top lane, 44 to 45. Didn't really have a CS deficit, but he has completely evened out the few he was behind. Neither of those guys have backed just yet, so if a teleport were to come into play, they're only going out with these first items that they purchased. A little aggression for the Scuttle Crab, but I think that's all we're going to get out of this. Yeah. I think you are correct. A lot of river control here by TSM. You look, they control both Scuttle Crabs as well as having some wards in the river. And it's only ended up costing Santorin about 3 CS against Meteos. It's been a very solid early game by TSM, and honestly, just a very well-played laning phase by Bjergsen. It's one thing mm -hmm. to talk about someone's general mechanics in the mid lane, oh, they land a lot of skill shots, oh, they get right. solo kills. But one thing about Bjergsen is, not only does he know how to zone people off CS, the CS that he can actually get, he almost never makes a mistake with a last hit timing getting pretty much everyone. And you, you say that's, as he misses one, uh, you say that's easy, but it, honestly, even pro players like Incarnation miss uh, several throughout the course of an early game because you're trying to keep everything else on track. Jungle timings, ward yeah. timings, harass windows, uh, but Bjergsen seems to manage it all most of the time. The thing is it escalates even more is when you miss the earliest waves that give you two, give you three, and have yeah. allowed Bjergsen to push Incarnation out of lane. Now that he misses a few, it's still going to hurt, but he wishes he did not miss those early ones right now. Not looking good for him. He did go back and get the tier. Still has Ghost up for a bit of safety here. 
And he knows the fear of Santorin now back somewhere in the jungle. Dyrus a little bit of roam as well. So it looks like they're going to start getting that chokehold onto any of the resources that Cloud9 is going to want. And if he if, if we can't get Blue to Incarnation, that's going to be very hard for him to do anything. Yeah. They've been able to push Incarnation back. He couldn't get Boots on his first timing. He did get the tier, but now they know exactly when he's gone back to base. Not to mention, Dyrus has been able to take his early experience advantage and make it so Balls never gets control of that lane. I mean, this is procedural play here by TSM, but they're doing a very good job of it. It doesn't even look like they will give it a thought either. Incarnation runs right up the lane. He's going to try to get as much CS as possible as it crashes into the turret, and everything going the way of TSM here with a 2K lead just nine minutes into the game. Or 1K lead, sorry. Always wondering how Cloud9 will play with the roster change. No yeah. high here to try and help him out. Santorin, big time gank coming down on a ball. So he's pushed up. Got him. They're going to just be able to sit on the equalizer here. And eh, good flash out as he makes sure he gets all the crowd control out of Dyrus. Balls stays alive. I don't know if we're going to be able to get anything from Meteos out of the bottom here, but it would help a lot for C9. Another gank through the lane there for Meteos. They don't even Ooh. have brush control for this gank. So a sweeper on Lemonation, but he yeah. hasn't swept that brush. I think it might just be a brute force type thing here. Uh, getting out of there. That's it's a lot of people. Cancel TP. Yep. Interesting. It would have been a Rumble teleporting in without an ultimate. But knowing TSM had no teleport support, this this could be a tower for Cloud9 if they want it. Smart play overall, actually. It looks like Balls may actually get to the top lane and stop Dyrus from doing too much damage to this as well. Dragons up. But with that teleport stop, I don't know if C9 feel they have the majority to take this bottom half of the map. Incarnation is just set so far back by that laser, and now not having blue, he keeps eating that damage. Still about 40 CS behind. Bjergsen. I really like what Bjergsen's done with his Victor build. He's gone for the second upgrade of the Hex Core, so he's augmented his Q as well. And what that does is it gives you a quick move speed burst every time you Q. The thing right. with that is Q's a two-part spell on Victor, so it does a small amount of damage, but then it then powers his next auto attack. So what Bjergsen is doing is he's using the Q for the move speed, then walking into auto attack range, getting the empowered auto. And the extra thing is with Victor's death ray, it's an instant cast from the point of origin. So when he gets close enough to be in auto attack range, it's an undodgeable death ray, which will always hit Incarnation. So it's this incredibly reliable, high potency harass that he is pushing Incarnation out of lane with. And he's now 50 CS up onto Incarnation this early in the game. That is absurd. Not getting any easier. De definitely using his veteran status here on the stage to work past any jitters that Incarnation could be having. Yeah, this is what happens when you're really far ahead of your lane opponent as Victor and why move speed can be so important because it's those guaranteed death rays and the incredible amount of damage that puts out. Well, teams are definitely taking note of this because you can see Santorin also dismantling Meteos' jungle, which this mid lane pressure is now hurting Meteos because he's having to cover things. and It's kind of falling apart here. Cloud9 has moved the bottom lane up to the top here, and they're going to try to start dropping some turrets after they got the bottom one. But it doesn't look like it's going to go down too fast with the TSM protection. Knowing that Hai was kind of the core shot caller for these guys. Lemon Nation definitely having a voice in there as well. Right. I would be very calm and vocal during fights. Yeah. Maybe maybe Incarnation can still kind of bring that to the team. Medio said don't expect too much out of Cloud9 at the start. If we look back to last split as well, Cloud9 was actually one of the most passive teams pre-15 minutes yeah. as far as kills and deaths. So typically they would kind of farm out the early game and then they excelled in the mid to late game. Right. This is actually only a 700 gold deficit, which considering the 50 CS difference in that mid lane, isn't that bad. If they can keep their turrets generally alive, they could still have a nice mid game power spike here. Uh, but it will depend on that shot call. Yeah. It's a lot of pressure going towards Incarnation every so often. They don't stick with it, though. If they don't hit him, they leave, and they'll be back within a few minutes. It's not a tunnel onto this guy to kill him. They know exactly what they want from the side of TSM. Just banking on this thousand, thousand gold lead. They're getting pretty much everything they want, slowly but surely. Should yeah. be a trade here. So two turrets now for Cloud9. Hopefully some... Deeper wards can be placed to stop anything from coming out. 
get Santorin's location. Still taking Meteos' jungle, though, so I guess Deep Ward's yeah. not really helping because they need him defensively right now. And Incarnation is just so far behind on his item timings. Uh, normally, you need Tier and then Ludens on the Kog'Maw before you even get there. He's still 500 gold away from his Needless Heal Large Rod, which is really far behind. Although, Dyrus is pushed up with no turret. Bad place Look to be. Cast on the hunt. Doesn't look like he's going to get any help up here. He should go down eventually. The rest of the team is working on Dragon towards the bot lane. And Dyrus is going to go down for the bet, you could say. Somewhat. If Medios is going to be up there, though, that's just not a place that Dyrus needed to be. It's true. Uh, not necessarily respecting the move speed buff from Sibra and the chase potential of Gragas, but of course the team was getting dragons, so at least they win something out of it. All right, so first blood goes down. TSM also grabs themselves a turret in the bottom lane previously. Jeez. Once you get that death ray maxed up on Victor, you just don't miss CS. You mm -hmm. go one death ray down the line and you clear it, which gives him a lot of roaming potential as well. Knowing blue buff shall be up shortly. Yep. They're going for that one again. Let's see now whether TSM can lend the proper support here. Now, we could be in for our first big fight over this blue buff because Kog'Maw needs it to continue to farm. That's another reason that this has fallen so far behind for Incarnation, because he can't farm from close range. He runs Oom trying to spam his ultimate for farm. He's already half man here. They're conceding. Here. They, yeah, they can't help. He's not coming out of the mid lane. Balls is still standing in the bottom, trying to get a hard push on down there. And TSM can just rotate to the top here. Bjergsen's obviously going to protect mid, but they may get a fight up there that they want. Santorin using that tunnel placed quite a bit ago. That's the one he actually just ulted to. We saw that happen in Balls' first gank. So Cloud9's not really even in their own jungle to clear out these wards, to clear out these tunnels that are being created. They're not really getting the fundamentals. Wow, yeah. it's making it easier for TSM to make all of these moves. Right now, again, brute forcing them off a turret. Cloud9 has had to find these when TSM is away and doing other things. And wherever Victor moves is where Cloud9 has to move away. Yeah. Because of how strong Bjergsen is right now with that 161 CS, less than Jeez. 16 minutes into the game. More than 10 CS per minute at the moment. So it's it's a rotational game right now for Cloud9. They, they do not want to fight TSM. And it's on TSM to force the right objective moves and not get themselves out of position because team comp wise, there's actually uh, some really good mobility on the Cloud9 side. The Nautilus Sivir combo, as far as catching people out, is very strong, not to mention yep. the Gragas initiation. So it's, it's feasible for Cloud9 to get picks. Uh, they just have to not be outnumbered when they do so. I can't recall. Does Victor Ultimate stay alive when you die? Yes, but it will not follow the target. Okay, right. So it stays still. You're, you, no, you no longer can control where it goes, but it'll definitely persist. Because I'm thinking if they if they bounce Bjergsen in, he could die fast to this composition. But if he gets his ult out as well, that could be a severely big error. Or a severely yeah. big error. So yeah. we'll have to see. Definitely an option to get the fight in there. They have to get a good flank on. Some forward wards placed by Cloud9, or at least catch TSM when they feel confident enough to go back in for blue, go back in for something that's not theirs. But right now, that's difficult, because everything seems to be theirs in this game. Just 16 minutes in, coming out very strong for the first game of the summer split. And it seems like, well, they may have righted their rungs to MSI. That was still international, so that will loom. Yeah. So we get to see them play that style of game again. Well. They haven't fallen behind in the early game, but they also haven't made too many uh, aggressive moves. That's mm -hmm. also because Cloud9 has been conceding a lot of things early on in the game here, and they still have to be wary of when Incarnation eventually finishes his loot and Echo, which already 17 minutes into the game with this tier is oh, very slow. 410. As far as loot and Echo timings go, it's a 1,400 gold deficit he faces to Bjergsen in that mid lane. That's almost... The whole gold deficit for the game yeah. is just based off the mid laners right now. But he finally finishes loots. Oh, there's one good thing that can come of this is he will now know that Bjergsen is going to come at him hard in the mid lane. He did not give up one bit. He definitely took it to Incarnation as he would any other. And Incarnation did not know what was going to happen. Even with the pressure of Meteos in the beginning, Bjergsen said, oh, there's Meteos. Let me pressure even more now. Yeah, just... So far, a good plan here by TSM. Uh, nice little five-man invade. They catch Cloud9 also sitting with five. They're able to mm -hmm. get deep wards at the start of the game. 
TSM then tracks Meteos very well through the early game. Bjergsen gets his first item timing when Incarnation does not. He uses that to bully the lane. The rest of the matchups have been going fairly well for TSM. Uh, the roaming hasn't provided yeah. any kills really for either support, but the carries themselves are farming up fairly well. Yep. Only one death for Dyrus in the top lane, and th that's all they could find. I mean, that's what teams try to find. Uh, in the end, that was only the first kill that really Cloud9 could get out of it. And Dyrus said those reasons really because he doesn't communicate to the team much. The way is pushing, like you said, the jungler's top. I don't need to be here kind of thing. So you may not see that happen again for them. We also saw both of these teams go through last season with many games where they had a lot of very low kills by the mm. end of the game. Especially when Cloud9 would win games. They'd win games like nine kills to one. It's when they started losing that they started doing crazy things. Yep. The unfortunate thing about this game is they are losing, but they're not really trying to take risks to get back into the game. Uh, they're probably just waiting for Incarnation to hit some better item timings and actually land Poke before an objective, mm -hmm. but he's just been so far pushed out that he's been unable to yeah. do so. The Ludens is there. Still, though, the mana just drops as soon as he starts to throw it out. Because he using, can't get his own blue buff. Yeah, using the consumables right away. Just tickling him right now. <laughs> Dyrus been able to get a lot of MR. It's another thing. They, they've Cloud9's put a lot of AP into this one team, which is allowing TSM to put some pretty heavy magic resist on their members early. Yerkson with the Abyssal Scepter. Great buy in this situation since it's Rumble, Gragas, and Kog'Maw. So much aggression. Hook's coming out, the lasers, Dyrus walking in as well. TSM wants this fight, whereas Cloud9 is kind of saying, we can only take this if they make a mistake. And they're already backing off wholly from this, knowing they don't have the wards, except for one right there on Wild Turtle. Slowly moving back in. Lemonation looks like he's going to be the meat wall in this one. Sneaky's still holding ultimate. Yeah, TSM will take a fight if Cloud9 engages, but don't expect TSM to go crazy here. Nope, oh, there's Dragon. They also have crab control. It might be difficult to fight in even with on the hunt, and they make it out alive. It doesn't look like there's going to be much of a fight anywhere for that one. Another Dragon over to TSM, and Cloud9 hadn't even been pushing middle, something we may have seen previously that they kind of take control of something, move TSM off it, but they're a little late to that. Yeah, kind of in between decisions that they need right, to make. Right, right. Whether it would be hard pushing mid lane or going down for the Dragon, they're they're just giving this TSM team a lot of respect, but kind of sticking in the game, right? They're not falling too far behind. The Dragons are starting to stack up. Baron will become a threat, but they've only lost their utter turret. So they haven't had that backbreaking moment yet. They're just getting kind of scratched out right now. Watch this. Near impossible to push this guy in. Well, if they get enough poke down, see? That was hit. Incarnation did get a blue buff for the first time this game. And let's watch this Luden's poke. They're just going to set up camp outside here since they know there's some TSM people that have yep, to go back. There it is. And they're going to delay the backs until they can get that mid lane turret. Especially coming up, he just hit level 12, so that range gets very big. Even his first level, he's like, this doesn't feel long enough. Level 2 and level 3, they both feel really good, and they're already starting to use it. Incarnation moving up with the tank line of Lemon Nation and Meteos with him. Looks like Meteos is still going to stay in the jungle, make sure they can get their wards pushed forward, and the first time they're really starting to put their foot down here. They did catch TSM after that dragon, but we'll see if C9 can follow up with this and keep it going. Yeah, all you need on an AP Kog'Maw, Ludens and a blue buff. Plus tier. <laughs> you did it. So much stayed, al damage. stayed alive in lane. It was rough. 231 to 171 there. Now, as a full team of five, cannot be stopped by just Dyrus himself, and the team isn't really ready wow. for it. Bjergsen actually wants to get his blue along with Santorin over protecting that turret. They feel like the fight overall may be there, so not worried to give this up. Yeah, poor play there by TSM. They heavily prioritized a blue, yeah. which isn't necessary at the moment. Now, they, they kind of sent half of their defense up to the top lane when they could have lost the turret anyway. They're going to try and get this mid turret down, but with home guard boots, Cloud9 can get back pretty quickly. It's going to be close. A little bit of Black Cleaver love for Wild Turtle, along with his Muramana that j actually just finished and that is 586 on incarnation so you can kind of see the difference between their tier stacking yeah so by the way uh, black cleaver and muramana are insane on <laughs> ergot uh, not only does ergot's noxian corrosive charge the thing that locks on his acid hunters uh, give you armor shred it also ticks physical damage very frequently so basically he lands e on someone and 
once his E is maxed, it's going to shred 50% of the opponent's armor for one spell, because that's the way Black Cleaver and the E will take He might as well just get down. naked. <laughs> it's going to help him out real, real heavily in these <laughs> fights. We'll see. Stripping people down. Here comes Wild Turtle from the top. Oh, he's taking some poke, actually. The rest of the team gets cut off as they weren't exactly dancing together too well. They're still going to stay safe on this one. Looks like we have Sneaky pushing up in the mid lane. He's going to call some pressure over. He should be able to just walk right out the bottom as he clears that with a boomerang. So Cloud9's kind of giving TSM the dance now. They're able to pr protect a few things and also push them off with the turrets. Looking better. The longer they do that, the better the chances are for Incarnation to get a little bit bigger. A little bit stronger. Great job by Darius in that top lane as well. Going down, still 185 to 152. Righteous Glory is finished, so they can kind of counteract any of the kiting they want to do with Sneaky's ultimate here. It's just getting yeah. better for him. If TSM actually gets a fight on Cloud9 before Incarnation can get poked down, yeah. it's not going to be pretty for Cloud9. Bjergsen, we haven't seen any team fights in these 24 minutes. If not for the, if not for that one gank fight, Darius would be approaching the record for longest uh, game without a kill. Maybe we can get a separate one for longest game before the second kill happens because we've gone a long time here with these guys just trying to trade objectives and conceding things. <laughs> Again, it looks like Cloud9 just maneuvering around. I mean, we're wondering whether they'd be able to kind of cheat advantages like they used to when they'd fall behind in the yeah. game and just avoid fights. They're doing that just fine in this game. TSM unable to pull the trigger on multiple occasions. Whereas Cloud9 is rotating around and keeping a pretty strong presence here. I can't imagine how these guys are going to assess the fight. They haven't done it in a while. Bjergsen's probably going to one-shot someone that they're not expecting it. Everything's going to kind of just happen immediately. Everybody's going to be like, whoops, didn't realize it. Oh, this works. It's going to be a very interesting fight. I don't think we've ever had this much of a gap between two and as many items built as <laughs> they have on each champion. 1-0, to zero, though, 25 minutes in as both teams are weary of making that big, big mistake. Yeah, well, this is where the Dragon Denial actually comes in. Notice how Cloud9 conceded the first two Dragons, but that Dragon number three is often the straw that breaks the camel's back in yeah. many situations. Oh, there it is on the hunt. Throws down the gravity field. It flashed over the wall. Death Charge is going to go off to the side, and they are right onto Incarnation. They let him run through the lane, and then they actually flanked Cloud9 on their own initiation. Team Solo mid now onto Lemon, and it looks like they will be able to continue down the pressure right to the inhibitor turret. Yeah, that's a lot of stuff taken by TSM. They get to choose their own adventure here. Where do they want to take the advantage? Because there's Dragon coming up, there's Baron already, and there's a maybe push down the mid lane. Maybe indeed. It took a little time for the minions to get there, and it gives Sneaky enough time with the team to just, oh, the, the ultimate objective. The ultimate the objective enemy's blue buff. indeed. Unfortunate once again for Incarnation on that, and the one fight they tried to take only gives two kills over to TSM, so you can still see how careful they are about taking these. Well, TSM wanted to double team that blue buff, which means Cloud9 might try and harass this dragon a little bit. It's going down low, balls to Sneaky, trying to 2v3. That here. turtle damage onto Sneaky, already half health, two shots. Great spell shield to stop the last one. Sneaky can't get another shot on a turtle. That lantern was amazing by Lost Boy. Now balls overheats in the fight. Lemon stuck with the rest of the team and Meteos on the top side here. So split on either side of the dragon. Nobody going down just yet, but they finally find all the HP of Bjergsen and cut him down. Both summoners used there, and it looks like TSM backs off. They do get the dragon. Yeah, TSM tried to take a little bit too much there. They wanted the blue buff and the dragon, and then that ensuing fight actually led to them suffering a casualty there. Bjergsen lost his blue buff, even though now he's been able to pick up a death cap, and Cloud9 kind of stays in this a little bit. Being down three dragons to zero obviously is an incredibly yeah. uh, hard thing to come back from, but at least the gold is still close. So one more tier stack by Incarnation, and he's all Seraphs and Braced up, so that's good for him. We saw the damage there coming out of Wild Turtle in the fight versus Sneaky. Everybody kind of can gauge the damage now. They know what they're going up against in these fights. Baron is definitely going to be an option quite soon. Cloud9 would love this. Dragon number four means even more of that taking time bomb number five. And getting Baron would easily help them push down a few of these turrets here. They need it. Getting flanked that hard on their own engage was not what they wanted. Yeah, I wonder when... And Dyrus will pick up home guard boots because yeah, there's, the, there's a potential that that could be a game changing fight. Uh, all, all TSM is worried about right now, I feel like, is just 
getting on Incarnation and making it so he can't poke. If Incarnation can stay in the back of these fights and poke, it's going to be huge. Now, watching this fight once again, it's a very slow collapse in by both teams because yep. the Dragon was so contested and slow since it was a 2v3. Watch the positioning here. TSM had to respect this, but Bjergsen tries to come in the side with a flank, and he doesn't have his ultimate because it's been so recent since the last yep. fight. And Meteos singles him out very well with the body slam for the stun and the ultimate to knock him back, which is what Meteos is going to want to do in pretty much any of these fights. Uh, Meteos needs to track his cooldowns very, very well because he yep. wants to use his ultimate to disrupt Wild Turtle's position reverser, which is very key. But also, he wants to use it to throw Bjergsen back, so it's really whichever one or opportunity comes first. And it's difficult. He's basically the only one. You have Depth Charge and Anchor Toss, but those aren't going to hit immediately. Mm -hmm. So you're right. It's going to be quite difficult. We did see, though, that caveat of grabbing Bjergsen with his ult down. You said he isn't able to crush everybody right away in the fight. So if they can keep doing that, kind of that is their prerequisite for the fight. They should be okay. He, however, has grabbed himself now a Death Cap also on that leveled up trinket. 315 CS to 227, just about 100 over right now in Incarnation. This is, like I said, Seraph's Embrace has been finished. A little more protection from him, but I don't know if there is enough peel unless Lemon Nation is hip and hip with him in, in Meteos in a fight. Yeah. It's going to be tough. The peel will be rather difficult. Sneaky, known as the best AD carry in the North American region, though. Yeah. Especially going Blade of the Ruin King, so he's going to try and peel a little bit for himself. It's always an interesting choice between Bloodthirster and Blade of the Rune King. This time with Bork, a lot of that has to do with some health stacking going down on the other side between Dyrus and Santorum, but not much armor. Uh, plus, when Rek'Sai gets close and knocks him up, being able to use the Blade of the Rune King active and then shoot backwards, especially on Sivir, who already has a lot of move speed from her passive and ultimate, will make the kiting very potent for Sneaky. Three percent, 47, a very, very close vote between all of the fans out there and a very close game indeed. There is quite a difference between the mid lane, but Cloud9 is keeping themselves in this one, holding on to the last few rungs of the ladder. It's looking shaky though. A few more engagements like what we've seen from TSM and the inhibitor turrets will be no more. We can already see Incarnation ready for what could be some of the final battles. The Sorcerer Elixir are there for him for a bit more damage since he's behind and already puts another Blasting Wand in there. Yeah, meanwhile, Bjergsen's already consumed his. <laughs> Bjergsen's sitting on 640 ability power right now. A massive amount for only being 31 minutes into the game. And they're, they're just trying to control this blue buff area. I mean, if TSM gets enough vision up, and keeps Cloud9 out of this area for long enough, they don't actually need to worry about having sweepers down because they would be able to keep them out and know there's no wards. But honestly, it's really all about just this blue buff denial over and over, so Incarnation can't poke them. Oh, he got it! Did he? Caustic Spittle for the win. Whoa, that is such a huge potential swing. With the blue buff onto Kog'Ma, it means TSM can't safely go in for this Baron because the poke can persist from Incarnation's Cog. What a game-changing steal there. Big. Now they have even more wave clear as well. So coming up to the turrets for TSM gets that much harder, that much easier for Cloud9. 40 on Dragon, a pivotal time here to get that blue buff. And you can see Incarnation, he's not spitting out loogies willy-nilly. He's still got a full mana bar and he is waiting for the fight to commence. Slowly but surely, the teams now are warding each other out here. Meteos actually gets popped, so he's forced to use the Raptor. And it looks like they are going to be setting up. 20 seconds before I think we get our first real fight here in this game. Both teams are going to have to take it. Number four is too big for TSM. I'm a, I'm a little confused by Wild Turtle's build, uh, but that's not relevant right now. They're going in. Nice catch on to Bjergsen. That was Bjergsen and Turtle actually hit by that, or Lust Boy rather. They start to back off of this one. They should be okay. Sivir Ultimate's used on that one. They're just saying the Righteous Glory would bring them back in range and kind of negate that distance, but everybody had a little too much yardage on each other. And now back down towards the Dragon. They remember the objective at hand. And it looks like still now, That's actually, pretty huge. I should say Equalizer down as well Three as Sivir Ultimate. Three Ultimates yeah. down for Cloud9. No Ultimates down for TSM, although Bjergsen is sitting at half health without heal. Tries to zone there. This could be Dragon 4. It is. Dragon TSM should fight. 4. That puts the timer on. C9 has to do something big before 5 comes up. That's six more minutes. And so far, one kill on to Dyrus is going to help that cause. Looking at Turtle now. 
Lost Boy puts up the box. That's going to stop the rest of the team from clearing through. It's the flash body slam on a turtle. Balls picks up the kill. Anchor Toss just missing Lost Boy, but there should be enough to take him down. And that's Incarnation with the living artillery picking himself up one. Five to three now. Cloud9 on the board with a few more kills. Such a strange fight right there. Cloud9 was down three major team fight ultimates, and TSM had all of theirs, yet they decide to split after the dragon fight, not commit for anything powerful, and just let Cloud9 kind of just mob through them. Yeah. Uh, even though I think TSM would have won that team fight, TSM got four dragons, but at what cost is the real question. This Baron's gonna go down. Eat it alive. One good thing about having a Kogma as well. That Blade of the Rune King only to boot and chunk down that beast. Baron goes over to Cloud9 after being on the back foot practically all game. 34 yeah. minutes in, they finally may be able to put their foot down and push some waves. Let's check this out again. Yeah, I mean, watching this, yes, Bjergsen's a little bit low, so he ends up giving water respect, and he's probably making the call to fall back because he himself is a little bit low. Dyrus had other ideas because he goes all the way in. The Caustic Spittle ends up zoning them out, and at this point, TSM scatters. If, if only they could have stuck together and all fallen back through the same choke, that would have lined up for Bjergsen's full combo to kill the team. But TSM splits up. Cloud9 stays together, and they also avoid Bjergsen, kind of the two things that need to happen for them to win a fight. But with three ultimates down, it's yeah. remarkable that they could win that fight. Remarkable indeed. That blue buff it, incarnation got back as TSM was stealing it, wore off just as they got to Baron, so it was perfect for that dragon fight, and it really did become one of the bigger plays that Cloud9 has had throughout this game. See what they could do here at their first set of inhibitor turrets. TSM really hasn't reached this point yet. They had a few good fights and then were staved off. Cloud9 here a bit closer now with a chance to keep going as the ultimates that all three that they used are back up now. Yeah, and the Baron buff, TSM with people back in base, although the tower sieging from these two teams is not that great. <laughs> little bit of yeah, little Sivir iffy. and Urgot are the AD carries trying to get up oh. both sides. And this is a brute force teleport engage. Dyrus coming in from the backside there. Did not see that, but Cloud9 forced to use the Sivir ult to put themselves back in the fight. There's two for Incarnation. Looking for a third one. Actually puts more damage on the turtle, so he cannot stay in the fight. Bjergsen with a sliver of health gets out of this one, and it looks like they are going to have control of the inhibitor. And with the Baron buff, this could be Cloud9 winning the game if they play their cards right. Bjergsen did not go down, so maybe he can hold them off. Cloud9 is going to take a whole bunch of advantages off this fight. Bjergsen does not have home guards right now which allows them to get the inhibitor but they don't feel safe enough to stay against the all-powerful victor right now maybe enough for a top lane turret if they don't Jeez. have to enter the base they're gonna have to be careful that damage onto incarnation makes them think twice they lose a bit of auto attack damage onto the turret and they may not have enough to clean this one up lemon nation gets taken down by the afterburst you can see Woo. these powered up mid laners at this point in the game. Even though Bjergsen has out farmed Incarnation by 100, the fact that the late game Kogma with level 16, just an unreal range on Living Artillery. It's basically the whole screen. Yeah. I think it's about 2100 uh, at the max rank. Plus Feels the good. Lutus proc and all the magic <laughs> pen he's put through. I mean, Incarnation is hitting like a truck right now. He is only going to get stronger. Just watching this fight, TSM. I don't think Cloud9 is going to be able to seize that turret, but TSM decides to go in anyway with Bjergsen really far behind. The Equalizer ends up zoning him. Look at how much had happened in that fight before Bjergsen is even invo involved. Dyrus was completely killed. Cloud9 is the one with the better team fighting play right here. Yeah. They just brute force their way into that turret. Ball Zonias is the aggro away to stay alive, and Bjergsen has to respect the Kog'Maw living artillery because he was late to the fight, and by the time he arrived, it was over. 3, 1, and 4 now. Something I really like about Incarnation's play already is that he kept a steady head. He wasn't trying to go for the blues when they were stolen. Looks like they could actually pick up Tyrus once more. Lust Boy there to save him by the skin of his teeth. Very nicely done. But as I was saying, Incarnation wasn't trying to be scared and get his blues back and then die for getting his blue. When his blue was being taken, he went to mid lane and he just farmed and he got what he needed to, knowing that that would be the safest thing to get him to a point where he could do this. And we always wonder where Cloud9's strengths come in. Their last split, they were not that crazy early game team, but it was their mid game rotations and late game team fighting. All those things are kind of showing true right here. Yeah. I mean, is this high in disguise, he loses laning phase and then he makes good calls and plays <laughs> for the rest of the team throughout team fights? High this, in in this incarnation guy, has been playing these team fights great mm -hmm. as Kog'Maw. Now they have the wave clear, and this game's about to come to a head here at the fifth dragon. 
if Cloud9 doesn't get this one, it's hard pressed to come back after five. It's really hard to come back from four to zero. The only time I can remember it happening last year is when COG actually Ooh. had four dragons on TSM. Yeah. And then they won some fights around the fifth dragon time. Roll reversal right here. TSM knows what can happen even if you have four dragons, especially now that they've lost a couple team fights in a row it's, and don't have vision control. It's got to feel weird when you think your upper hand is when you force fifth and now you're you're afraid to force fifth, but you're you're forced yeah. to force fifth. Watch, a lot of forcing. Watch the pre-fight poke here from Incarnation. That's the key. He has a blue buff, which is oh. huge, and they end up fighting up top. Incarnation's around the wall. That's Balls looking to throw down. Go back and forth. A lot of good damage done on both sides here. Mostly the Lemonation, though, is look at TSM's health bars. They are feeling too good. That's the Equalizer. Splits Dyers from the team, but only for a little bit. Goes for the Flash Body Slam Doesn't just get in the middle. Did not get them. And they're able to react. Bjergsen very low, but still fighting from the outside. And that's going to be Turtle going down. All summoner spells used by him before he got that off to give the team a little bit more oomph in the fight. 50 seconds just about on the members of C9. Oh. There's another one down as Bjergsen pretty much one shots out in the Lemon Nation. TSM is just kind of getting the stragglers right now of C9. After this dragon, it's going to be a very hard push, possibly towards the top lane if this bottom wave doesn't push fast enough. Yeah, Meteos went for the hero play, but he couldn't get the stun or knockback oh. on a Bjergsen. That's what ended up losing that fight. The poke is still pretty immense, but the blue buff the is gone from Incarnation. Here we go. Dragon goes down. That is going to be Santorin's. They have five. They have Aspect. And top turret, rather, bottom of the inhibitor is taking some damage. Woo. So five dragons for TSM. They managed Woo. to survive that fight. That means a whole truckload of AP uh, because that doubles all the previous bonuses, which is massive for Bjergsen. The minions end up taking down a turret on the side. Oh, so close on TSM's Nexus turret as well. The minions were so close to taking that down. They home guard off the base. It should be all right there. And TSM gets back to repair on that one. Wow, that Nexus turret has about 200 HP. So because of the double bonuses from the fifth aspect of the dragon and the fact that the hex core already gives 168 ability power to Victor, uh, Bjergsen's sitting at 891 AP right now. I'd say that's a lot. Uh, the rest of TSM still pretty tanky, but honestly, aspect of the dragon helps you within a team fight. Yeah. If TSM can't actually get fully engaged with Cloud9, which was kind of the struggle at the start of that last fight, and if Incarnation can successfully poke, before a fight, Cloud9's actually still in this one despite being down five dragons to do. Also, as we saw in that play, which had to have been set beforehand, was that promoted minion taking down that top inhibitor turret as well. So Lustboy had already thrown that on throughout the, the dragon, banger minion. the fiasco. They had things planned ahead. They're setting the chess pieces in order before they really need it. Oh, the red carpet laid out for Team Solo mid. Nicely from Balls there. They're going to take quite a bit of damage. It may be enough to finalize a few kills in this fight. Balls over the wall, but then he just Sonya's, and he's able to keep enough damage onto Lustboy along with Sneaky to get another kill. That's going to be Balls going down by the hands of Bjergsen as he starts to make his way out with Turtle. These guys are trading back and forth very nicely on priority targets. What a fascinating game here. That actually counts as a win for Cloud9 because all they're trying to do is withstand this fifth aspect yeah. of the Dragon buff. It's a three minute buff. It'll fall away in about another 65 seconds. So TSM may have lost their ability to force Baron with the five Dragon buffs. And this is all because Cloud9 was willing to make a call and go in aggressively. As soon as they see Bjergsen isolated from his tank line, they throw down the Rumble ult. That's immediate. Then Meteos just goes to look to separate them. Bjergsen back. Santorin forward, and the rest of the team is there supporting damage. As far as team fight coordination this game, there's been one small misstep from Cloud9, and that was in the yeah. fifth Dragon fight where Meteos missed his flash body slam. Outside of that, it's been Cloud9 finding the small windows to take down TSM and making it count. Incarnation getting another blue. Very necessary for him. We already see Elixirs coming out and a few other champions. Balls has one. Sneaky's picked up. Picked up. A quick silver sash, easy to say. Looks like everybody's getting the full items here. You're not going to be able to do much more on either side. A promoted minion also just came out from Lust Boy. It looks like that was just right down the mid lane. Yeah, it's always good to track those guys. Where do you put it, actually? I'm trying to find it. Somewhere. It'll pop up. Yeah, either way, this is now... The fifth dragon is gone. So Cloud9, if they were able to fight them with a five dragons, they can definitely fight them with yep. four. Knowing there's no turf behind TSM, you can see 
TSM actually has to give this a fair bit of respect. Death cap completed onto the Kog'Maw as well, so he's a full item behind Bjergsen, but just as potent in team fights, just because AP Kog is ridiculous. It's a bottom lane beauty down yeah. there with the big wave. Plus, the hyper late game Urgot versus the damage output of a Sivir. Right. Unless Wild Turtle can swap sneak yeah. in and kill him quickly, the Sivir will be doing more damage throughout the fight. Four, five dragons down. Now only four dragons down. Cloud9 remarkably still in this game, trying to win their debut with their new mid laner incarnation. Oh boy. Well, they can definitely figure out what's going on and fix mistakes mid game with this composition already that we've seen. We know that Incarnation, as we said before, can keep a steady head in the game. Meteos was back and forth, although having a bit of trouble in the jungle at first, finding ganks. Oh, man. Still kept the team in for the fights, and that promoted minion was in the bot lane. Yeah, and it's doing work right there. Lust Boy finding the right lane, perfect lane to promote the minion because they know they're going to be playing this around the Baron right now, and someone needs to go down and deal with that giant minion wave, but Whoa. they have to fight now. That choke point, though. That Ludens hit coming out as well. They're going to wipe down Team Solo mid here. Bjergsen very low, can only do a few things from the outside and he might cast his last ability here. His death comes from the explosive cast and a slam of the belly coming in from Meteos. A triple kill for Sneaky. Ball's chasing out Dyrus and potentially an inside the park ace here as Dyrus won't be able to do much for the team but run away. That choke point that TSM walks through. Cloud9 again finds the fight, giving up five dragons throughout the game, but now with 50 second death timers across the board and Maokai is the only one surviving for defense. This could be Cloud9 winning their first game. Very nicely done. They are going to rush up the mid lane, Jet. It took quite a while. We had one kill for 23 minutes in this game, and now it surmounts to 15 to 9. 45 minutes in, over 100 CS behind. Incarnation held his breath in that mid lane, making sure he could make it to the mid, make it to the late with his team. Dyrus doing his damnedest here to shut down Cloud9, who already had the head-to-head -head against Team Solo mid, and look to stretch it just a little bit more. 45 minutes on the clock. TSM trying one last time to go for broke on the stoppage, and Cloud9 pick up the first win of the summer split over Team Solo mid. Wow. Against the defending champs right there, too. Down 100 plus CS in the mid lane. Five dragons to zero. Yet Woo. Cloud9 wins the team fights down the stretch. The Rumble Ultimates from Balls in the critical choke point. Sneaky staying alive in the team fights and the Ludens procs there from Incarnation's Kog'Maw. It's just enough to take down CSM in 45 minutes. Enough indeed. Very nicely done by the team. Strong play throughout, keeping their heads up as well. It would be very easy for a new player to just kind of feel down and out, be quiet in that situation. They even have a little bit of tilt yeah. when you're zero something, 100 CS behind. And it just took a little bit of time. Cloud9 actually flourished where they always do, right in that mid-game delay. Mid-game team fights right there. Cloud9 comes up big once again. They they know though. You can see they know. Look at yeah. that. That oh yeah, we squeak by. I think we squeak by. Yeah, <laughs> the owner of Cloud9 is like, you know, there's a little word there when they had five right? <laughs> just a little bit. A little worried indeed. Let's get over to the this is damage chart and see what Incarnation did for his first day on the on the job. A lot of it. Incarnation doing 39,000 damage to champions. Highest in the game. Yeah. Second highest with Stinky, 35,000. 31,000 for Bjergsen's Victor. That is generally how AP Kog'Maw works, though. He's almost always doing the most damage. Yeah. This, this one, though, uh, with the giant CS discrepancy, just had to hit that item breakpoint. And that's why Cloud9 was giving away so many objectives yep. in the early game and so many dragons because they knew at any point if they get the right initiation, which was a rumble ultimate in a small corridor that for some reason TSM was walking through yep. in 45 minutes, uh, it turned it. Just beautiful, beautiful placement there. Poor positioning by TSM down the stretch. Yep. And this is definitely not everything's fixed, incarnation is great for Cloud9. <laughs> not at all. Because there's plenty of learnings to being taken from this game. From both teams as well. For Cloud9, why early? For TSM, why late? It's pretty <laughs> much what needs to be fixed out of that game. And it's it, it's changed. It's not something that plagues them all the time, but they definitely need to pull one for Cloud9 in the early game and TSM in the late. Because when you see what Cloud9 did there, they just held it and they said, 
well, let's figure out why we're getting beat. How are they beating us with this composition? And they didn't even let really one of their inhibitor turrets fall before they were able to figure it out and start pushing back. Yeah, there are definitely things that Cloud9 shouldn't have done in that game, which led to their deficit. Right. And there's definitely things that TSM should have done to not lose that deficit. But at the end of the day, it is Cloud9 over TSM. And as far as the NALCS is concerned, that's all that matters. <laughs> that's all that matters indeed. It's only one game. Maybe more soon. We're going to throw it over to Freak and Zyrene at the Telestrator.